The Secret Intelligence Service found out that someone stole something from a man named Alan Turing. He was living in Cambridge and working as a teacher at that time. The police went to his house to ask him about the robbery, but he didn't seem to care. The police didn't like his attitude and thought he might be keeping something secret. This is a story about a man named Alan Turing. A long time ago in London, there was a war going on, and many children had to leave their homes to stay safe. Alan was on a train and saw a kid doing crossword puzzles. He went to a place called Bletchley Park, where he was met by some important people. He talked to a man named Commander Denniston who asked why he wanted to work for the government. Alan said he wasn't very interested in politics, but he was really good at math. He liked solving puzzles, and he thought that cracking the German code would be like solving a puzzle. The commander didn't believe him, but then Alan said the word, Enigma, which was a top-secret program that he knew about. Alan explained that Enigma was a really good way of keeping secrets, but he thought he could figure it out. The commander didn't think anyone could do it, but Alan said he could try. Alan is now working with a group of five others named Peter, John, Hugh, Keith, and Charles at Enigma, secret machine which is used by the Germans to send secret messages. The machine is really tricky to understand, and the team doesn't know the settings to decode the messages. Every night, the Germans change the settings so the team only has 18 hours to figure out how to decode the new message each day. This means there are millions of possibilities every day, and it's really difficult. The boss of MI6 tells them to work together because people are dying because the messages are not decoded. Alan explains that all the secret messages are around them, but they are locked with a code. The code is really hard to figure out, and there are so many possibilities that it would take a really long time to try them all. In fact, it would take millions of years. The team decides to take a break for lunch, but Alan doesn't join them because he is not very good at being social. He prefers to work alone, and he starts designing a machine that could help them break the code. It's 1951, and the detective who had come to investigate Alan's robbery earlier finds out that Alan's records are kept secret. He doesn't understand why a math professor's records would be kept secret, so he becomes suspicious. To find out more, he uses a typewriter to create a fake document that lets him see Alan's records. Going back to 1939, Alan tells Commander Denniston that Hugh Alexander won't give him the money he needs to build a machine. The commander says the other codebreakers don't like Alan and suggests he talk to someone else. Alan suggests firing everyone and using the money to build his machine instead. He asks who the commander's boss is, and he says it's Winston Churchill. Alan writes to Churchill through Stuart Menzies, and Churchill puts him in charge, even though Hugh was in charge before. Alan then fires two of his teammates, Keith and Charles, because he thinks they're not good at their jobs. When someone sarcastically asks if he was popular in school, it means they're teasing him for not getting along with his teammates. In a flashback to when he was a schoolboy, Alan was teased by his classmates because of his OCD. They made fun of him for keeping his carrots and peas separate during lunch and even buried him under the floorboards. Alan reflects on why people like violence and says it's because it feels good, but without the satisfaction, it's meaningless. He remains calm under the floorboards, and his classmates leave him alone. Christopher Morecambe, a fellow student, rescues him and tells him that they picked on him because he's different. Alan agrees but Christopher encourages him by saying that sometimes it's the people who are underestimated who go on to do great things. In 1939, the code-breaking team needed more people to help them, so they created a crossword puzzle that was very difficult and put it in the newspapers. They asked anyone who could solve it to come and try out for the team. While the war was happening, many people were hiding from the bombs and bomb shelters. Only a few people were able to solve the puzzle and were brought in for a test. One woman named Joan Clark arrived late because her bus had a flat tire. The team didn't believe she was in the right place until she told them she had solved the puzzle. Alan gave her a difficult puzzle to solve, which she did better and faster than anyone else. Joan and a man are chosen to work on a secret project and are warned not to tell anyone about it. They are threatened with execution if they reveal anything. Joan is curious about what they will be doing and is told that they will be helping to crack a code used by the Nazis. When Alan was in school, he became friends with Christopher, 
who introduced him to a book about codes and ciphers. Alan realized that people could hide their true meanings behind their words, just like cryptic messages, and he didn't know how to decipher them. In 1940 at Bletchley Park, the team is setting up a new supercomputer. Alan is worried when Joan doesn't show up to work. He goes to her home and tries to persuade her parents to let her work with them. Joan explains that her parents don't think it's appropriate for her to work with men. Alan suggests she work with other women in the clerical department, even though this is not what she will actually be doing. Joan agrees and leaves with Alan. She asks why he's helping her so much, and he says that sometimes people who others think are ordinary can do extraordinary things. In 1951, a detective named Knock tells Superintendent Smith that Alan's military file is missing. The records of his time during the war are not classified, which means they are not secret. Someone has removed and destroyed them. They think that Alan may be a spy for the Soviet Union. In 1940, Joan starts working at Bletchley Park pretending to be a clerical worker. Alan tells us in the movie that British people were very hungry. Americans sent food, but the Germans kept sinking the ships that carried it. Every night at midnight, a bell would sound and reset the code they had just broken. Hugh, frustrated with the work, visits Alan, who is working on his machine called Christopher. Hugh tries to smash the machine with a wrench, but the others stop him. Hugh thinks the machine is useless, and they should find other ways to help in the war. One person tells Alan that their relatives are fighting in the war, but they don't have anything to show for all of their work because of the machine. However, Alan thinks the machine will eventually work. Later on, Alan is alone in a secret hut. He takes a bunch of secret messages encrypted by the Nazis on the Enigma machine and hides them in his socks. He manages to get past the guards at the checkpoint without being caught. He goes to Joan's house, climbs in through her window, and shows her the decrypted messages from the Nazis. They talk about Christopher and the idea of creating a digital computer. The military police come to search Alan's desk in a secret office the next day. They tell him they think there's a spy among the codebreakers and show him a message they found going to Moscow. They think it's him because he's alone and different. The commander says if Alan is caught, he can be killed. Joan meets Alan who is working on Christopher and takes him to a place where they sell beer to make him feel better. Later, Hugh, John, and Peter join them and Joan is friendly to them. In private, Joan tells Alan that she's a woman in a man's job and she can't afford to be unpleasant. She advises him that Enigma is smarter than him and he needs the help of his team, who won't help him if they don't like him. The next day, he takes Joan's advice and brings apples as a gift to his team. He also tries to tell them a joke. In a memory, Christopher passes a note to Alan in class. The teacher makes fun of them for writing nonsense. Later, Alan finds the note in the trash and decrypts it. It says, See you in two long weeks, dearest friend. This means that the school is going on holiday. In 1941, at Bletchley Park, Joan and Alan become closer while working on breaking codes. Hugh Alexander comes by and suggests a way to make Christopher work faster by running wires diagonally. Alan takes this idea and the machine is turned on. It works and they wait to see if it can help them break the day's Enigma code. We watch scenes from the war. Deniston is informed that the machine is not working. He visits Alan's hut, but Alan tries to stop him from coming in by blocking the door. Eventually, they force the door open and turn off the machine. Deniston tells Alan that his machine hasn't actually broken Enigma and hasn't produced any results. An associate from the home office is upset about spending a hundred thousand pounds on something that doesn't work. Alan's machine didn't work and the commander wants to fire him. But his colleagues, Hugh, John, and Peter, stop the commander, saying they believe in Alan's machine and that they'll also have to be fired if he is. Hugh reminds the commander that they're the best codebreakers in Britain and asks for more time. The commander grants them one more month to make it work, or else they'll all be fired. At a place where people drink beer, Hugh tells Alan that he decoded a secret message that said, Ask and it shall be given you, seek and ye shall find. Matthew 7 verse 7 Hugh says that he believes Alan is not the spy because he wouldn't use a simple Bible quote as a secret code. In 1951, a police officer tells Detective Knock and Superintendent Smith that Alan Turing is a homosexual, 
and was caught with a male prostitute who later robbed his house. The police officer thinks this is the information that Alan was hiding from them, not that he's a spy. However, Detective Knock believes that Alan may be hiding more information and wants to arrest him so he can question him. In 1941, Joan finds Alan in her apartment, trying to solve math problems for the Christopher machine. She interrupts him to say that she has to go back home because her parents are unhappy with her being unmarried at 25. Alan suggests that she should get married. Joan thinks he means Hugh or Peter, but he actually means himself. He proposes to her with a ring made of electrical wire. At the beer hut, there's a party celebrating the engagement of Alan and Joan. While they dance, Alan tells John that he is homosexual. John is kind and understanding, but he warns Alan that it's illegal and that Deniston is already looking for a reason to get rid of him. John advises Alan to keep it a secret. When Alan was in school, he wrote, I love you, in code to give it to his friend Christopher. However, when school resumed after a holiday, Christopher didn't show up, so Alan couldn't give him the message. In 1951, a detective named Knock questions Alan about hiring a man to touch his private parts. The detective asks if machines can think, even though Alan's work is about something else. Alan replies that machines cannot think like humans, but they can think in different ways. He explains that people have different preferences and tastes, and this is because everyone thinks differently. Alan tells the detective about a test he created called the imitation game, which can determine if something is a machine or a human. When the detective asks what Alan did during the war, Alan lies and says he worked at a radio factory, but the detective suspects this is not true. In 1942, Alan and his team were waiting for their machine, Christopher, to crack the code. However, the midnight buzzer went off, meaning that they ran out of time. Christopher couldn't process enough possibilities in the 18-hour time limit. At the beer hut, Joan's friend Helen is talking to Hugh. To impress her, Hugh pretends that Alan believes men and women shouldn't work together because they might fall in love. Helen agrees because she has a crush on a male coworker who she communicates with through intercepted German messages. Hugh takes Helen to the bar, leaving Alan behind. Alan realizes that the German messages always begin with the same five letters, which Helen thought was the name of his girlfriend. Alan explains that the Germans choose five letters randomly but he used the same five letters because he's in love. He jokes that love has lost the Germans the war. Everyone runs after Alan as he rushes through Bletchley Park, past guards and security checkpoints. They enter their hut and Alan shows previously decrypted messages. He explains that Christopher doesn't have to search through every possible setting. The computer can search for ones that produce words he knows will be in the message. They notice that every 6 a.m. weather report ends in Heil Hitler. They ask Christopher to search for the words, Weather, Heil, and Hitler to crack the code. They test it on a 6 a.m. message. Christopher stops at a certain point. They take the letters it produces and go back to the Enigma machine, typing in the same letters. They are able to decode a message. They have successfully cracked the code. The team worked all night and figured out where all the ships were in the Atlantic. They found out that the enemy was going to attack a passenger convoy that was very close. They wanted to warn the people in charge, but one person stopped them. He said they couldn't warn anyone because if they did, the enemy would know they had figured out their secret code. They had to keep it a secret to win the war. Some people on the team were upset because they knew that innocent people would die. One person even had a family member on one of the ships. They argued, but the person who stopped them from warning anyone said they had to let it happen. They said they were the only ones who could make this decision. Alan and Joan take a train to London and meet with Stuart Menzies in a tea shop. They tell him that they have figured out how to crack the German secret code, Enigma, but they need his help in deciding which information to use and which attacks to stop without making the Germans suspicious. Peter is angry with Alan because he knew that Peter's brother was going to be killed but didn't do anything to stop it. Peter knocks over Alan's books, and while Alan is picking them up, he sees John Cairncross Bible. Alan notices that it's bookmarked on a certain page, which makes him realize that John is a spy for the Soviet Union. John sees Alan making this discovery and confronts him privately. John tells Alan that the Soviets and Britain are working together, 
but he also threatens to reveal that Alan is gay and ruin his career if he tells anyone about John's secret. Alan tries to call someone, but he knows his calls are being listened to. He goes back to Joan's house and finds Stuart Menzies there. Menzies tells Alan that Joan is in trouble because they found secret messages in her stuff, and she's been sent to military prison because they think she's a spy for the Soviet Union. Alan says he gave her the secret messages so they could break the code. Menzies tells him that John Cairncross is the real spy and that he knew about it from the beginning. He put them in Bletchley so they could share information with the Soviets. Cairncross didn't know he was being used. Menzies needs Alan's help to decide what information to share with Cairncross to give to the Soviets. Alan is worried about Joan's safety, but he can't tell her directly. So, he tells her that he's gay to try to get her to leave Bletchley. Joan doesn't really react to this news and says she suspected it for a while. She tells Alan that they can still be friends and get married for other reasons, even if they don't love each other. Alan lies to her and says he was only using her to break Enigma and doesn't care about her. Joan gets angry, hits him, and says she's not leaving because she's tired of people underestimating her. She calls Alan a monster. We see old video clips from World War II. Alan says in a voiceover that they decoded messages every day, and their work was important for winning the war. On May 8, 1945, the group celebrates V-Day. Menzies tells them they have to destroy all evidence that they broke Enigma so no one can use it again in future wars. They also have to act like they never met each other. In 1951, Detective Knock continues to question Alan. Alan challenges the detective to decide if he is a machine or a person by playing the imitation game. He then asks if he is a war hero or a criminal. The detective tells Alan he can't judge him. In the past, Alan was asked by the principal about his relationship with Christopher Morcom, whom he was romantically interested in. Alan denies the relationship to avoid getting into trouble. However, the principal informs Alan that Christopher has passed away due to bovine tuberculosis, and he was not aware of his illness. Six months after the interrogation, Alan was found guilty of being homosexual and had to choose between two years in prison or two years of hormonal therapy. The therapy would damage his brain and make him unable to continue his work. Joan visited him and tried to comfort him, but he had a panic attack. She reminded him that his work had made a big impact on the world and that he should be proud of it. She said that he was not normal but that was a good thing because he had achieved great things that normal people couldn't have. She told him that people like him, who were underestimated, could do amazing things. In 1953, Alan is alone in his home. He looks at Christopher, his computer, and remembers the love of his life. He turns off the lights. Then, we see a flashback of six people burning all the evidence they had about cracking Enigma. Turing's work encouraged further study into something called Turing machines, which we now call computers. This work has inspired generations of researchers.